Oh my God, no. That's not how you drive an ambulance, especially in the United Kingdom. If you want to know how British paramedics drive their trucks, please stay tuned for a couple of minutes. My name is Alex Hepner and this is Group Call. So everything started with a simple question asked by my friend Tomek, who is a HEMS paramedic. He also runs the most popular medical block in Poland called Pre-Hospital Block. By the way, check the link in the description below. So he asked me, how do you guys drive the ambulances in the UK? Because in majority of countries, there's no training, just keys, and here you go, drive it as you stall it. So I said, no, matey, in this country, there's a huge science behind it. And if you don't believe me, better believe this person. Mr. Nick Lambert, Head of Education, driving. We have two ways of training our ambulance drivers. It depends what level they come in. So for our patient transport services, which is our non-emergency side, we deliver a one-week training course uh, where we embed some key systems about smoothness and safety, obviously because of, of our precious cargo that's on board. Um, the second uh, side we have is our emergency response training side, and they could be people that have already done our one-week course previously, or they could be new into the ambulance service. And that's a four-week structured emergency response driver training course where we train staff to become emergency response drivers, we teach them advanced driving skills, we teach them how to handle the larger vehicle in various road, traffic, weather conditions, uh, all to using the system of car control, which is a, a, a road cough based system. But hold on, let me, let, let me stop you here. Why do you need a system? Uh, you, you should have the keys and here you go, drive it as you stole it. Keys and drive it as you stole it. The, the trouble with keys and drive it as you stole it, we'd end up with lots of accidents, probably many fatal accidents. And thankfully, due to the system that we put in place and uh, using our system of car control, which is a, an evidence-based system, it's used by all emergency services, our accident and collision rate remains very low, which, is, which we're very thankful for. Uh, and so we use this evidence-based system. It's based on two books here. You'll see um, uh, there's Roadcraft, which is the Advanced Driving Police Handbook, and uh, the DTAG book, which is the Driver Training Advisory Group, which is uh, made up of the heads of departments of driving nationally. And we all feed into these books. So you um, are a co-author of one of those books? Well, I, I've, uh, I've fed into this book. I'm, I'm a contributor to the, to the Roadcraft book. We have a, a rewrite every few, uh, every few years, and uh, I was a co-author or a contributor, really, rather mm -hmm. than a co-author. Uh, but basically, the experts get around the table. We discuss uh, best practice. We discuss things like incidents. So, for example, the police were having uh, a, a quite a large amount of collisions with vehicles after new tyres had been fitted. Mm. And so we made sure that we then highlighted the fact that actually fitting brand new tyres, everyone thinks they're, they're, oh, they're sturdy, they're safe, but actually they take some bedding in time, some scrubbing in time. Mm. So actually, um, so it's a lot of it's reflective practice, similar to paramedicine, mm -hmm. uh, and we learn from our mistakes. But it's also been going for 50 odd years, this book here, and the police have been driving and instantly when the book came out, it, it reduced driving collisions in the police back in the 60s by half. So it's a, it's a really good way of doing it. Few more words about the training set. So four weeks and what do you do with people throughout those four weeks? Brilliant. Please. So four weeks, one of the things we look at is habits to start off. Everybody has habits. I won't say they're bad habits, but everyone does have habits. Uh, so we look at these individual habits. We look at how they steer. We look at how they change gear. And we, we structure it into a, to a systematic approach so that we're only ever doing one thing at a time. And that then creates smoothness, safety. It also thinks about vehicle stability so that the vehicle's always stable. Let's talk cornering, for example. Mm. Most people will come into a corner or a bend and, and from when they learn to drive will break into the bend and break round the bend mm -hmm. and be in the highest gear possible for fuel economy. And they'll have very little to control of the vehicle, not that they don't know that. Uh, with us, we think about getting the appropriate gear and speed before we get to the bend. We put the vehicle, set the vehicle up in the safest part of the road, and then we use a gentle part of acceleration to keep the vehicle stabilised, hunkered down and balanced throughout the bend. And that keeps the vehicle at its most stable. And when we're driving vehicles that are five tonne, mm -hmm. stability is really, really important. It is, isn't it? So, um, for uh, four weeks you're driving on blue lights, or is it, is it divided into two parts or three parts? So it's, it's divided into two parts, really. Uh, well, probably three parts. The first week is the getting used to the length and, uh, of the vehicle, and we do reversing and manoeuvring exercises, cones and things like that. Then we start week two, we start building on exploring faster roads. Then we start picking up our speeds a little bit. So we start in national speed limits. We'll claim speed exemptions without emergency warning engaged, just to start building speeds up. 
And then from that point, we'll then move on to our emergency response side. So once we've got all the foundations, it's like building a house. We put the foundations in, we get all the brickworks in, before we're going to put the roof on so and the, the the blue lights is just like the icing on the cake at the end all the skills are there and uh, they've got that ability to then just gently progress through the traffic with all the other distractions things like siren use uh, road positioning uh, hopefully will already be embedded cool do you think that we can see this system uh, in use so can we join one of your di's and and, and go to oxford a absolutely we'd love to take you out come and join us and we'll take you out on a trip on oxford Hi there, my name's Chris Harty. I'm 40 years old. I have been with SCAS for a year now and uh, I've just uh, been a driving instructor uh, since I started, been developing. Uh, previous to that, I was an advanced driver with the Metropolitan Police. Busy ahead. Nobody on the crossing. Again, just looking, bringing that speed down every time my vision drops. Looking for pedestrians coming from each side checking the junctions nowhere to go here so i'm just taking the sirens off to take the pressure out of the situation and when the gap opens up we'll put the sirens back on lights are red ahead can't see to the left hand side so i'm just bringing that speed right down we're following the road ahead looking for pedestrians and vehicles from the left and right everybody on the right stopped everybody on the left has stopped checking those mirrors and going straight ahead Pedestrians coming from either side of the road, junctions that are blocked from view, pedestrians in the middle of the road, just making sure everybody's settled before we go through. Change of sirens to try and get the attention of the bus ahead of us. Again, waiting for that gap to open up before accelerating, looking over, under and through for feet. Thanking people for helping us. As we approach the cars in front, we're looking to get a reaction from them, bearing in mind if they're not watching, they may slam the brakes on, so we have to be prepared for that. And we want to try and encourage them into gaps on the left-hand side, so ideally we want to move, move them to the left. Sometimes people are very good at looking their mirrors early, they might have a window open and hear your sirens come in. And sometimes at this speed on these roads they might not see or hear you for a long time. And again, it's about encouragement, trying to get in their mirrors, using those sirens to try and get their attention, not bullying and not forcing anybody into gaps that don't exist. And eventually, as just happened, he'll move over for us. Why we don't push the people out of the streets? Why we not using bullhorns? Because it's dangerous. We don't force people. We're trying to ask the public to help us. We've got no exemption in, in British law to push people into gaps that don't exist, push people through red lights. It's can you see me? Can you hear me? Can you help me? Okay, so we've got solid traffic. We are going to try and do what we call part the waves. So we're going to try and go up the middle of the two lanes. We're going to have to bring our speed down, constantly check our mirrors and pick out every car and make sure each and every one of them has seen us. Why are you doing so weird things with your hands? Why are you not driving with one hand? Okay, so the hand positioning is 10 to 2 or quarter to 3, but we're having the hands on the steering wheel. We don't want to wrap our thumbs around the wheel because if we crash, we can end up breaking our fingers. Uh, we keep our hands in this position to keep a nice relaxed grip on the wheel and so that we can use pull-push steering. So we yeah. pull down with the dominant hand and the weaker hand or the opposite hand just supports the wheel. Why do you use this push-pull steering? The pull-push steering is the smoothest way of steering the vehicle, especially large vehicles like this. And we do that for patient comfort. We're trying to uh, maintain the stability of the vehicle so that we stay shiny side up on the road and also for patient comfort. Choosing my gear and then push-pull steering as we go around to the right, pull down with the right hand and support with the left. Feeding the wheel between your hands rather than rotational steering where the hands fight against each other. 
we should be checking our wing mirrors the highway code tells us about every 10 seconds or so 10 to 20 seconds but we teach to change check wing mirrors um, every time there's a change in speed or direction i'm still surprised that you are you don't use bullhorns seriously i mean to me it was the biggest cultural shock when when i came over to this country six years ago that you guys are not trying to force yourself through the traffic you are so polite and and and, and leave the space and basically don't bully people absolutely um, everything we do in this country we try and do with the help and the consent of the public so we don't bully people um, we try and do it with the public's help and consent and if they trust us if they help us then it makes our job a lot easier there is no call that's so urgent to justify us having a collision so if it takes an extra 30 seconds to get there safely then we'd rather do that than arrive 30 seconds earlier or maybe have a crash maybe not arrive at all that's it guys thank you so much for watching i hope you enjoyed this episode uh, if you fancy a bit more clinical stuff next time please check out my youtube channel or simply go to www.groupcall.uk and check out uh, stuff there. Uh, please don't forget to like and subscribe. My name is Alex Hepner and this was Group Call.